Welcome to Strength Chat Podcast, presented by Kabuki Strength. Introducing your hosts, Chris Duffin, the mad scientist of strength, Rudy Kadlov, mature athlete and coach, and the wizard of training himself, Brandon Sen. Welcome, welcome to, stre- to strength. Well, welcome to. Ah, uh, oh, are you doing the intro this week? I I do the intro every week. All right, you go can ahead. You can. No, I don't. I don't know it. I, I, I you don't. I, I wasn't it's sure if really, you were going to do it or not. It's it's really hard to memorize. No, oh, go ahead. Uh, it's okay. all right. Welcome, Welcome to, to Strength Chat. Chat. <laughs> Damn you guys. <laughs> I had this whole plan. I planned this all day. I didn't get any tell. work done. I can <laughs> tell. I just jumped in on you, man. I'm taking the cue from you. All right, go ahead. No, go ahead. You do it well. You do it be- even better than the first guy that did it on our, you know. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm rolling. I'm, not I'm rolling. Even, I'm not even near my mic. <laughs> John's getting Welcome to Strength Chat to do. with your host, the mad scientist of strength, myself, Chris Duffin. To my right, I've got Dr. Rudolph, our master athlete and coach, and to my left, I, I I'm think, still here. I don't, I don't think he needs introduced today. Nah, he, he, his <laughs> reputation precedes him. Ah, uh, yes, the wizard of training himself, <laughs> Brandon said. Do you need to say that again? No, it's okay. okay. It's all right. All right. So um, today we're really happy to have on uh, Dr. John Rusin. And uh, uh, if you don't know John, well, you should. Um, he's uh, got quite a bit of content. Um, writes for Men's Health, Teen Nation, Bodybuilding.com. Um, He's got his own, uh, he's a doctor of physical therapy, has his own clinic, and uh, again, uh, he's just producing a lot of really good content out there on a lot of the same principles that we believe in here at Kabuki Strength. So thus, we, we have, uh, have you on the podcast today, John. So uh, welcome. Guys, it's great to be here. That, that was quite the introduction. Uh, that might be the best introduction of any podcast that I've been on in a couple of years now. <laughs> yeah, very nice. I mean, uh, you mean, then they in, need to step up their game because that was uh, not mean the part, part where we introduce ourselves or introduce you. <laughs> uh, no, no. When you guys were introducing yourselves, you know, I've never had like the triple headed monster coming straight at my face on a podcast. I think this is the first time. Yeah, it's actually a form of muscle confusion. <laughs> so, um, you know, John, we met uh, in person for the first time. I think we've talked a little bit online over. Uh, quite a bit before that, but uh, was at, uh, in Toronto at the uh, Swiss Symposium. And it was really, we had some great conversations both in the, in the uh, hotel lobby, cab rides, and uh, just uh, really engaging and good discussions. And uh, so really happy to have you on and so we can kind of continue that. But some of our audience may not be you know, too familiar with you. So tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to, to be where you're doing what you're doing right now. Yeah, so my background is in high performance strength and conditioning. Uh, I'm an uh, ex collegiate strength and conditioning coach uh, for basketball, baseball, and football. Uh, I also have a doctorate in physical therapy, as you alluded to in the introduction. So, really, our thing right now is uh, using both of those specialties and really concentrating on injury prevention, uh, pain-free programming for the athlete and the fitness consumer. So uh, we do work here in person in our facility here in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, produce a ton of content online, uh, speak around the world on these uh, pain-free training methodologies, and really just have a mission of trying to program and trying to coach a little bit smarter so we can prevent injuries from from ever happening in the first place because as we all know sitting here today injuries are a bitch to come through and they're even harder to actually produce results if you uh, have injuries that are either in your past or you're currently battling through so that's our big mission yeah you know that, that's a that's a big thing and I, I talk to younger lifters about this quite a bit and it's you know realizing that you know how They'll ask me, well, what about this movement? Doesn't it have a, such a great reward or, you know, just different? And I'm like, you know, is it worth it? You know, if you can add up, you know, all the time, like over 10 years of training, let's say, and, you know, like if every six months you are backing down because you're hurt, you know, what's the cumulative effect of that? And the more, like you said, the more pain-free tr- training that you can get in, one, you're going to avoid, you know, every time that you have even a minute injury, that's a that's – a, that's a flag 
that something's wrong, right? And so the more of those minute injuries you have, the higher potential you have of one of those major injuries happening. And this is actually used, you know, my, my personal backgrounds in industry. And you would use markers of, like, how many minor injuries are in a workplace. And you can actually calculate, you know, how, you know, when – What's the potential of there being, you know, something like a death in the workplace, something like that? Because they're correlated, right? Um, and I think the same thing happens with training in the in the body. Would you would you agree with that, John? I would definitely agree with that. And you know, really, with like the young lifters, we have so much information out there at this point in time that sometimes we get stuck in the theory of exercises as opposed to training a movement pattern that ideally fits your body, your skill set, and your current goal set. So kind of differentiating those two things, that is really the first cornerstone of pain-free training because, uh, you know, you want to avoid injuries, obviously. Uh, You know, every coach or personal trainer should be having that in the forefront of their mind before they go in programming or work with a client. But, you know, it's easy to say that and it's actually harder to go through and uh, go through the executional details and the programming details that actually produce pain-free results for the long term. So what are, let's say, uh, what are your top three tenets of pain-free training? I mean, does it include uh, programming, uh, technique, uh, amount of load? What is, what is the, uh, what are your tenets? Well, I think everything is based off of a foundation that has nothing to do with training. So the foundational principles of pain-free training is nothing to do with training at all. It's uh, things like stress levels. It's things like sleep quality. Obviously, nutrition plays a huge factor. You know, those things that you can't out-train. So once we kind of have a conversation with our athletes about those foundational principles of just being a healthy human being, the next step is actually uh, getting movement patterns that are ideally fit to the person and that are individualistic with their programming. So I'm a big believer that there are six foundational movement patterns that everyone should be able to train at some capacity. And I'm not talking about just athletes here, but literally every single human being on earth. Uh, Those movement patterns are the squat, the hip hinge, single leg stance, pushing and pulling at the upper body in some sort of locomotion. So finding those umbrellas and finding the exercise variation under each of those umbrellas, really that's uh, the second cornerstone of pain-free training. But obviously uh, that is dependent on proper execution, proper form, proper technique, and when you get down to uh, looking at the different metrics that you can base training off of, uh, loading, frequency, all of that stuff, that's all dependent on actually having movement patterns that look the way that they're supposed to look and actually function towards a goal. Yeah, I mean, that's a couple really big points there. And, you know, that's, that's where our injuries occur, right? We have one, it's that cumulative load. It is not just your training load in the gym. Like you said, it's all those other factors. And a lot of people don't realize the, you know, the, the effect of the stress and sleep can have. And you know, you've got limited reserves. And if you're pulling away from that, you know, you're going to consume some of that in your training and you're going to be in a position where you have potential for injury. Obviously, you know, movement quality is going to be pretty big there. But you know, just think about you know, all the issues that we have from you know, people with stress and the tightness and shoulders and traps and all that stuff. And, and it's then now you go in and you try to train and your scaps are not moving correctly. Right. And you blame, Oh, well it's, it's problem because I'm pressing. Well, no, it's the problem because you're stressed out at your job all day. Um, or, you know, some of those other factors. Yeah, right? right. You didn't get enough sleep. The, the nutrition's not right, but then, you know, you're not feeling quite right, but then you fight through it. You try to fight through it. You think I should be hitting this number and that's when injuries occur. Well, the body doesn't know the difference between sources of stress. Uh, And that's a really important point to try to uh, educate your clients and your athletes on. So if you're stressed the fuck out at work, you know, that's something that is going to be a systemic response very similar to overreaching in the gym. And when you kind of break it down like that, 
you look at having those foundational lifestyle principles that you have to abide by to get world-class results in the gym, and really everything should be pushing uh, towards that same goal. But many times, uh, strength athletes especially, we like to think that we can out-train everything. We can out-train our diet. We can out-train our sleep patterns, our nutritional practices. And many times we can to some extent, and then we always hit the plateau. The plateau either happens with your performance or most of the time it happens with flare-ups and injuries. You know, I have uh, just some random thoughts rolling through my head here, but uh, a number of times I've had an experience where I've had a day of like horrible sleep or no eat, no eating or something's just gone wrong, um, and then I've come in and just had this amazing training session. Now, that doesn't mean that those, those things are good, but it's really clear to me like when I reflect on those that really I'd actually put myself in a position where I was on that side of, you know, I was on the adrenal release side of the, 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 the nervous system, right? And so I was basically that heightened piece actually improved my training. Now, if I tried to do that for two or three days or a week, that's where we've got a problem, right? You know, your single outlier in one session doesn't mean anything. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting cause just, you could, you know, I come in, it's like, man, I, I only had like three hours of sleep. This should, might be a horrible session it ended up being amazing, but well, there's always pros that's and not going to happen. That's not going to happen again and again. Right. <laughs> exactly. And, and when you look at the success of a single standing training session, it's very hard to quantify. So you come in with no sleep, no food in your system, and then you you know you pull uh, PR record uh, numbers or something like that. You know what is the after effect of that? Mm -hmm. Did your recovery just shit the bed at the end, or did it take you down to the point where you couldn't train effectively for the next two weeks? There's always uh, more than just uh, the numbers on the bar or the type of performance that happens within uh, a 90 minute period in the gym. So just taking that into account, you know another. One of the big principles is that you know we should be always trying to look at sustainability of your physical practices. So if it's not something sustainable, like yeah, there's times where uh, peaking for a meet or a competition or something like that, that's going to be planned. But for the general fitness population, the people that just want to look better, feel better, and function better, it's about sustainability and it's about the step-by-step -step forward approach as opposed to the ebbs and flows of the peaks and the, uh, and the faults into the uh, – you know, into those risky types of situations that you're talking about. Yeah. And that was kind of the point I was trying to make there is that you can't judge it just on like one, one point and run reference point. But also in that you, I could definitely tell of, you know, the, you know, I'd already, I was already on that side of my nervous system and consuming those resources. So, you know, after I come off of that, I'm going to be in a much worse condition. Oftentimes that ends up following with picking up a cold or something like that directly. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. <laughs> John, tell us a little bit about your personal training background. I, I know that you've done uh, some powerlifting and you, you write a lot about uh, different techniques and uh, uh, sumo versus conventional, et cetera. But uh, tell, tell our listeners a little bit about your training experience. Well, I uh, started off early on in my career uh, working with field and court sport athletes. So uh, in college, in high school, uh, I've had the ability to coach professionals in nine professional sports here in America, uh, eight gold medalists in the Olympics. So my mindset's always been in high performance. So I try to practice what I preach, even though I'm not a high performance athlete myself these days. Uh, we train on a very similar model as what we preach and what we write about. But really that model was centered around making sure that our athletes were at the top level to compete at whatever their sport was. So having that mindset, you, you really break it down and you think about like, what's the best possible thing I could do for this athlete at any given point in time? And it took me years to figure this out. But uh, I kind of concluded after a couple of years working with these high performance athletes that as long as I could keep them healthy and secondly, I could make sure that they're healthy even with the stresses of the sport, that they would be in a better position to go out and they could perform better. They could make more money. Uh, everything was good as long as they were healthy. 
And really when you take that mindset into account, uh, things like performance enhancement and really just working on specific uh, metrics of physicality, uh, those things really fall into play too. But it's really about that uh, injury prevention mindset first. And sometimes that's a hard mindset to have because there's truly no 110% guarantee that we can prevent injuries. Random shit is always going to happen. But Anytime that you can do something above and beyond, whether it's uh, programming a little bit more savvy, better coaching cues, better setups, uh, better loading scheming, uh, those are things that, you know, it's almost neglect neglectful if you don't do that for whoever your clients are. But, you know, going back to my, my training myself, uh, we uh, train on the functional hypertrophy training platform. It's, uh, it's a little bit of everything. So we like to say that it's a nice eclectic approach to pain-free strength and hypertrophy. So a little bit of power lifting, a little bit of bodybuilding, obviously a lot of athletic performance and injury prevention. So we try to, uh, you know, try to kill multiple birds with one stone, so to say. And this so, is the, uh, the FHT um, you know, program that you've got? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's that's actually been something uh, – we released it to everybody about 14 months ago, but it's a, a, a programming scheme that I've been using for about six years now personally and for about five years with my athletes. So you said powerlifting, bodybuilding, and then um, – athletic performance training is that so define that is that uh sports specific is that what you're talking about uh not necessarily sports specific but uh, the kind of the way that we break it down uh we we review this in our seminar series too is that we try to prepare uh our clients and our athletes to actually train in a way that you would if you were working with uh you know a gold medalist level olympian so the dynamic warm up sequencing is going to be very very savvy it's going to be very uh concrete and you're going to get a lot out of that so your prehab rehab happens right into that window we work a little bit into uh, the big powerlifting movements, the big three, but also place an emphasis on uh, those foundational movement patterns in a power and strength uh, type scheming. And then it moves into more accessory work where we're working on cleaning up weak links, uh, enhancing posture, and really just trying to build functional muscle in the right spots. And then our cardio, our conditioning, um, you know, kind of our finishers is a little bit more of like a strong man or an athletic performance feel. So a little bit of everything there. And it's just kind of a culmination of uh, my different backgrounds. So uh, it's the way that we've been training for a while. And, you know, it's a way that people can train exactly how we are and how we have with our athletes in the past. That sounds very, very similar to what we do, <laughs> except for that last yes. part, the uh, cardio and conditioning piece <laughs> at the end, the finisher. I leave that part yeah. out. But the finisher. <laughs> we finish say him. cardio with a great You leave assault. that part out for sure. <laughs> so I leave that part out. I, yeah. So A lot of times we talk about injury-free training. People instantly assume it's just doing less and they're not going to make the same amount of progress. Right. You know, how can we communicate the fact that injury-free training is, number one, it's performance, right? You know, a lot of times when we're talking through these developmental movements that we have in Kabuki.ms, we approach it not from directly from an injury prevention standpoint, although we know that as the coach, that's what we want to get out of it. But first of all, we tell the client, you know, this is how we're going to produce more force. This is going to you know, be how we produce more power. And, you know, it's also how we prevent injuries. So how do you take that stigma of just, you know, injury prevention is only doing less and now say it's actually all of these other things? How do you approach that? It's harder to approach uh, from a buy-in factor with somebody who hasn't sustained a major injury. But this day and age, especially with our physical culture, I feel like a vast majority of people have had serious injuries and they know the repercussions of either having to go under the knife or being out of training for six months to a year. So the buy-in factor at that point is very, very easy. Um, but for you know the young guns, the people that are really looking at performance, the great thing about pain-free strength is that it's one and the same with performance. Um, you know, joint arthrokinematics and biomechanics, it's all the same. So something that produces maximal amount of force and torque and stability, 
it's not only going to be pain free, but it's going to optimize performance as well. And that's one of the biggest secrets in the industry is that you don't necessarily go out and talk about injury prevention. You just do it because you know it's also going to produce world class results in terms of uh, the performance that you have goals for. So it, it depends on the verbiage, but for for many people that we work with now, um, you know, it is a very diverse clientele at this point. We're working with a lot of like ex meatheads that were collegiate or professional athletes that just want to look, feel, and function better. And their buy in factor is very, very easy. But for our high performance athletes, I think the ones that truly have a relationship with their body and its function, they know the power of feeling good and trying to prevent injuries because the more that they can stay on the field, uh, the better that their career outlook is going to be. Yeah, and that's a good point. I think if if they don't understand the importance of training outside of pain, because you know if we if we take an athlete and we say um, how important is injury free training for you, they're like ah, I don't care. You know, put <laughs> put a hundred pounds on my squat. You know, whatever. But until they actually get to that point where they realize, oh, you know, I actually need this, then it becomes much more important. Um, but we found that you know approaching it from one a performance standpoint when we're dealing with athletes really. Uh, solidifies the idea of quote unquote injury free training. Yeah, that's we we really do frame our discussions that way and that helps with that buy in. And the output is, yeah, you're gonna hurt less, you're gonna feel better, and that will automatically get that. We'll coach people through the movements on performance and like, oh my God, this feels my knee doesn't hurt. Oh my back doesn't hurt. That's great. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You can't improve if you're hurt. Yeah. Exactly. I mean to that point, Rudy, it's it you cannot achieve two world-class results simultaneously. It's hard enough to achieve one. So if you're literally trying to bring your body back from the depths of hell, uh, coming back from an injury while trying to get bigger, while trying to get stronger or more powerful, that's going to be a very hard feat. So, you know, putting the horse before the cart, that's a very important thing. And that's getting pain-free, moving with uh, good capacity. And then that allows you to optimize your performance. But again, it's the job of the coach to use the correct verbiage and use the right communication skills to get an athlete to do what we want them to do, what they, we know is right for them to do, and them to have the buy-in factor because they see uh, actual attainable uh, progress towards the goals that they think are most important, but it's the synergy between the two things. Yeah, I, I definitely jumped the gun. I, you know, I had a uh, double shoulder replacement surgeries this year, one in May and one in October, and uh, the the about the time I met with you and at Swiss in Toronto, uh, I'd been five months post op on the on the May surgery and was feeling great. Had this had the uh, other surgery at the end of October. And while sitting around in a sling with a left shoulder, I decided, you know, I'm ignoring my right shoulder, and I jumped the gun trying to push that too far, too fast, and you know, it set me back. Now I've, you know, I'm now I'm dealing with some other issues, just because the athlete wants to go sometimes too fast. The they they they're not patient enough, and, and the coach has got to uh, be able to show them the the right path there. Not don't proceed too quickly, like you just said. You can't do both. <laughs> it, it's hard because we all want to train maximally all the time. We exactly. love this shit. Exactly. We love stepping into the gym every single day, and I like I personally depend on it to enhance my lifestyle. I'm a better father if I go and I perform good in the gym. I'm a better husband. I'm a better businessman. I'm a better coach. And you kind of get stuck in thinking that, hey, if I don't continuously progress with a linear model, that somehow uh, you know my whole lifestyle is going to be derailed. But when you, when you step back a little bit and you, you shoot for more long-term based goals, I know for, uh, for guys like you, Chris, it's hard because you are literally at at a world-class level right now, one of the, the single best people in your sport, you know, you might not be, uh, you know, looking for something longevity like I am right now, like 10, 20 years down the line, but chances are, I'm, I'm betting you are looking for that longevity in your career too. Absolutely. And like, like you said earlier, you know, injuries still happen. And particularly like in my case, you know, I'm trying to push the limits of what is, you know, the body in mind or phys- you know, capable of. And so when you bounce against that, you know, sometimes that doesn't go your way, but at the same yep. time with, you know, putting this stuff in place, you know, five, six years ago, 
I was getting hurt left and right, and I wasn't near as strong or moving the weights that I am now today uh, on a regular basis that I am now. And, uh, you know, so it's I've gained both significant performance and injury reduction. Does it mean I don't get injured? No. Um, but, uh, you know, th- I'm there, I'm turning 40 here in a month and, uh, I'm as strong as I've ever been in my life. So, yeah, I, I mean, really, have you really got stronger or you got smarter? Hmm. I mean, yeah, he has. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's really learned a lot. I mean, it, obviously. And, uh, I think that's important. It, it's not just about the, the, your physical capabilities, but, but being smart about your training and your preparation. I almost look at um, you know injury prevention as the type of nonlinear model that you look at uh, enhancement of strength or power. So when I have conversations with my athletes uh, in our office here, they come in with past histories, uh, <laughs> surgical histories, past injury histories. Everybody has these at this point, but it's uh, it's false to say that you know coming back from an injury, it's going to be you know just all up up. Uh, uphill steps. You're just not going to be able to do that. So when you look at progression, especially with injury prevention, you can progress in many different ways. You can reduce uh, the frequency of injuries that you have so you can get hurt less. You can reduce, if you do have a flare-up, the severity of those injuries. You can bounce back quicker. Um, you, know, you can be able to train through or be more self-sustainable with um, what gets you back to feeling good if you do have those flare-ups. So there's many different ways to progress, and it's not just about uh, you know, the amount of flare-ups or injuries that you have cumulatively. So... You, you mentioned you work with, you know, your, your coaching resume speaks for itself. What type of tools do you use to manage these things outside of just having an eye for coaching? Is there any specific autoregulation uh, methods that you use? Do you have any, you know, maybe wellness questionnaires? Are you looking at behavioral changes outside of the gym? What are your go-to um, systems for managing, you know, pain-free training? Uh, it's very uh, it's very subjective for us. Um, so I spend a lot of time in conversation uh, on our initial athlete intakes. So when we bring in a new client, uh, it's anywhere from about two and a half to three hours. So I really want to have a great understanding of their lifestyle factors. I want to have a good understanding of what their goals are what they've had success with in the past and their struggles. And it's not just about training at that point. Uh, We really just go down the rabbit hole and get a really good understanding for what their struggles are, what their successes are. So at that point, that should really lay down the foundation. Um, We don't use any fancy tools. Um, I'm a hard guy to buy into some new technology because I think that there's just so much that hasn't even, uh, you know, hit the brink of improvement Uh, You know, the low hanging fruit is still out there so much that we just need to maximize it at that point before we go into uh, more fancy uh, auto regulations or heart rate variability or any of that stuff before. But, you know, having conversations with your clients, being able to be a savvy communicator, not only with your mouth, but with your eyes, with your ears, uh, really just looking and seeing what good movement looks like, looking at facial expressions during lifts, looking at the smoothness of the kinematics of movement. Um, It's just things that you can't fake working with people one-on-one sometime in person. It's things that, uh, you know, our industry has done a very, very good job to bring industry leading experts to the online space. Uh, I'm one of them, but again, I, I always say that you know world-class results are always going to be gained uh, when you have two eyes on you at all times when you are training, and that's really the personal side of personal training or strength coaching. Yeah, I think having that 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 initial sit down, I can imagine covers a plethora of of information that you need to learn about the athlete, and then especially if you're coaching those people one on one, ongoing. I mean, that's uh, you know, that's that's having the coach's eye, you know, being able to manage your people, and you know, the longer they're with you, the more that you can, uh, you know, learn more about them, essentially. 
Our, our model has definitely evolved over the years. Um, you know, a majority of the sessions that we do now, it's really consulting with athletes that are very savvy in their trade. So we try to work on the things that they cannot do on their own. So we'll spend an hour and a half working on, uh, you know, squat form. We'll optimize their stance. We'll make sure that their loading parameters are right so they can go execute on their own. But if we see somebody uh, four times a month, for training, that would be a lot. So a lot of the work that we do, we have to get the process started with uh, questionnaires and intakes, very general stuff. And then it's really important upon that first and second session just to make a um, huge impact on getting a personal relationship with them, especially if you're managing them remotely as uh, many you know world-class strength athletes do is everyone's using remote coaches now. So the difference between having a personal relationship and actually having the ability to look somebody in the eyes and know their goals and what makes them tick, that translates far better even if you are uh, programming remotely uh, on the online space. Yeah, even though we do a lot of our coaching remotely, we, we still have all of our initial um, questionnaire reviews via Skype for that very reason so that we yeah. can, you know, we could easily look at the paper and say, all right, you've got these injuries, so here's the approach we take. But, you know, it's it's really goes beyond that into saying, all right, how did you sustain these? What's the, you know, the current effect? Um, how's it bothering you now in everyday life? What can't you do? What can you do? And oftentimes people will tell you much more than what they'll put on paper. Yeah. You know, people, uh, we found it's actually really funny. If, if you only had that one source of contact with your coach, you would miss so much. You know, people tell us, uh, you know, they'll, they'll tell us for five, ten minutes about everything going on with them while, while they'll, uh, you know, only spend a few minutes actually writing it. So it's a huge value in that. I mean, in that two hour session, uh, maybe like uh, an hour and a half of it is spent in subjective verbiage. And all that we're doing is looking for that one sentence that they say that will identify their linchpin of performance or dysfunction that will literally revolutionize the results that we're going to be able to get with the client. So it's like all this freaking talking for literally one red flag that we can actually take action on. And that's going to be the thing that produces results that where nobody else has been able to do it before. How do you recognize that? What, I mean, give us an example of someone you're talking to someone for two hours and what, what one <laughs> sentence, one sentence they come up with and, and all of a sudden the bulb goes on for you. Many times it is uh, things that they've had success with in the past, whether it be like a manual ther therapy-based treatment or a specific movement or a cue that they say to themselves. And then that just hits the light bulb in my head to try to uh, just piggyback on top of that one little success that they had. Because most people, you know, if they're hiring you guys, they're hiring me, they're pretty into this shit. So they have a relationship with their body, the way that it functions, but they might not have the educational background or the true expertise of every single aspect of the human body and how it functions to know exactly what to do with the feedback they're, that they're getting. So I'm a big believer that you know, the best doctors, the best coaches in the world, we cannot feel what an athlete can feel internally. So it's our job to try to identify um, what makes them most successful because they can feel things that we can't. They can uh, have that gut-based approach of what is working and what is not. And it's our job to go down that rabbit hole and to try to find more of what's working for them even if they don't know it exists yet. So when you are dealing with someone who either has an injury or someone who's developed an injury, what are your steps that you take from that moment? So our process is, okay, we know that we have for the majority of our lifters are competitive lifters in you know, powerlifting um, or any other strength sport. Say someone gets injured, they can no longer squat. Maybe we try and fix the issue within the squat and then we move to a close variation. Can't do that and then we move to this. What are the steps that you take after someone sustained an injury to get them you know, back to normal play? So we always start at like the apex of strength movements, which I personally think is barbell-based big three movements. 
If we can't do that, we take one step down. And we try to get it to the point where we are challenging them with the highest level of compound or isolated base movement, but that also yields good movement capacity and also pain-free. So, you know, you could break down any movement pattern into a hundred different uh, exercise variations. So it's actually spending the time to figure out which one that they can take the parking brake off of their car to allow themselves to literally train that movement as hard and heavy as they possibly can without fighting their bodies in the process. So this this is going down the rabbit hole. It does take a little bit more time, a little bit more focus. But again, that's what uh, athletes are paying us for when uh, they're coaching with us. So it's our expertise in finding what we can manipulate and the kind of movement variability that we can put in play to actually get uh, a training effect from. But any time that we have to modify somebody down, so say they can't barbell back squat, for some reason, their shoulders shot. If we're going to modify them down and put them on a safety bar, for instance, we have to have a plan of action in order to remediate the origins of the problem. So it's not just about modifying down and then up, oh, you have to safety bar squat the rest of your life. It's not about that. It's about putting things into play that are going to rebuild the faulty movement patterns. They're going to be rebuilding the painful patterns and they're going to try to improve while training a pain-free movement pattern. So again, this is where uh, the dynamic warm-ups come into play. This is where secondary recovery and prehab days come into play in addition to the actual strength and conditioning programming. I think that has to be one of the most important takeaways of this call is you know you don't have to do the thing that's hurting you to get better so many people get stuck in the mindset of you know the big three or you know x exercise is going to yield this result and it's you know physical adaptation is simply not that specific that you have to do that one thing in order to get better so you know finding those those pathways and uh, developing that understanding that there are other options that you know aren't painful or that are repeatable even uh, is so important. You know, we'll have questions from people of you know what's my, what's the best stance for me, what's the best grip, what's the best uh, deadlifting style, and almost always are. Um, you know, or they, they might say one hurts them, but if they think they can be stronger in it, it's almost always about repeatability. You know, which one can you do more consistently load more often, um, and actually perform properly versus the one that you think you have to do. And those are the two biggest stink- distinctions in my opinion. Yeah. But at the same time doing the work, like you said, yeah. you know, if you're on the safety squat bar because you, you have some shoulder issues. Yeah. We're going to be safety squat bar or duffalo bar squatting yeah. or whatever it is. Um, <laughs> But you're going to be doing the work on the shoulder, you know, to to regain those patterns and, uh, you know, whatever. Maybe it's mobility, whatever, whatever, whatever the issues are. But you're not just like ignoring that. Well, there's addition or there's enhancement of a program by both addition and subtraction. So it's subtracting the shit that is actually leaving you broken down and hurt. And it's adding the things that you need to put in play to rebuild yourself back up. So at the end of the day, you have a strategy to move forward and get back to doing whatever you want to do without restriction. I think a lot of people think they're improving the injury too, but then if you actually retrace your steps and go through, okay, how many, you know, maybe correctives or how many stability drills did you actually do to, to fix the problem? It'll be, you know, very minimal or, or maybe once a week that they did it. So, um, return to play strategies are huge, especially in barbell sports. Yeah. What do, uh, what do some of those dynamic, uh, warmups you know, prehab, rehab days, what do they look like for you as far as like, you know, general scope of like number of movements, length of time, because, you know, I I think the, you know, the movement side of the, you know, the, the exercise, exercise field gets a bad rap that, you know, know, we expect people to be doing like, you know, hour and a half worth of drills and train them for 15 minutes. And everybody I talk to, you know, that's really not the case. So yeah, the, This was what I presented on at uh, Swiss for part of my uh, presentation, but it was uh, something we call the six-phase dynamic warm-up sequence. And literally, you can get through it in six to eight minutes if you are a non-painful mover. It goes up to maybe about 12 minutes if you're a painful mover. And in that time period, you can get done your soft tissue work, your dynamic oscillatory stretching, corrective exercises, activation, central nervous system prep, and your foundational movement pattern development. So that's a lot of shit 
in a very small period of time, which again goes back to the point of you need to have a goal for anything that you put into your programming. Yeah. If it's not working, <laughs> then you know, throw it away. Chris is, Somehow we're singing from the same hymnal Chris here. is okay. so desperately trying to get a word in because he's like, oh, that's what I say. That's what I say. <laughs> single minute, single minute. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Where did that's you learn that, John? It. Where did John learn that? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we try to hit home that point also because it's that people are expecting it to be something different. You right. know, when you talked about this, you know, you know, this gold medalist level, you know, you know, warm up drill, you know, they're thinking, you know, 45 minutes or something <laughs> like that. And, yeah. you know, same thing. Our, our view is actually a little bit longer. So I give people nine minutes total. Yeah. But you have to have a goal. Like, that's the problem. People are just randomly doing stuff where they randomly see like these exercises and we're part to blame for it. You know, we put stuff out there. Hey, here's a great shoulder work. Here's great stuff for your hips. Here's great. And so people just like add it. You don't have to do that. all of them every day. This, <laughs> and they add this and it's like, no, what do you need? Like you specifically. Okay. Yeah. I mean, having all those, those six phases, they should all be coordinated together towards one single goal that you're working on. So it's not uh, three phases towards this and three phases towards that. It's everything is going to be sequenced together. And when you get that, you get the synergistic effect of all of those different strategies uh, placing you into a better position to start your training than as you did ever before. But uh, touching back to like the recovery programs, it looks very much so like the dynamic warm-up, but we just draw out the soft tissue work a little bit more. We'll go five to 15 minutes there. We'll do uh, some global SMR work. We'll do some uh, biphasic stretching, which is dynamic oscillatory stretching combined with static stretching and postural de dependent positions. We'll do flow-based movement drills. And then my favorite, the sexiest of all recovery is low intensity steady state cardio, aka walking. Mm -hmm. And the looks on people's faces, especially the high performance athletes, when you have them walk on their off days, they're like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> I want a gold medal. Like, I can do more than walking. Like, I can do sprints. Like, no, no, no. We need to bring it back down and have a goal in mind there. But it's, uh, it's simple stuff, but it's just executing it very pristinely and always with a goal in mind. Yep. No, it's about fitting it into a system too. You know, that's that's kind of what you mentioned. You're doing a lot of things, and if people, you know, abstractly just you know see this giant pool of things that they have to accomplish, there's so many other things that are going to just oh well, I'm doing this, so I might as well do this. So it's so important to have it, you know, in a system actually aimed at the the in, the intent of the day, which is you know training. Yep. You know, having a goal in mind fits right into, you know, my area of expertise in psychological kinesiology. And it's so important to uh, people to have the right goal in mind, you know, the goal that they set that they that's challenging, but, you know, achievable and that they really believe in it. And it's important for the coach to uh, to buy into that as well. And I think we're, something you said earlier, which is so important, it's that listening, you know, and that intake part of it, we're listening for that one nugget. You can't feel how they feel, but you can listen and understand what they're thinking. And that thinking, whether it's good thinking or bad thinking, is important for the coach to understand because, you know, the, the negative words, I've, I've never done it that way, I don't think I can do this, uh, that's not my, you know, stick, whatever uh, is, is, a, uh, is a view into, into their mind and their ability to achieve success in the future. I couldn't agree any more. And the way that we communicate with other human beings is maybe the most powerful thing that we have our, at our disposal to both enhance performance and prevent injuries. Because being a human, making a human connection, identifying the language that is going to be the make or break to a program, you know, that's really the cornerstone back there. Just like you were saying, Rudy, it's, uh, it's finding that one nugget. And then just going from there and going down the process that uh, without that one nugget, you know, your results would be left up to chance. So a little bit more about, I mean, you train uh, athletes from a variety of different sports. And I, I know there's a recent article on your website. I think it was by Matt Ibrahim or something. But there's a quote in there about deadlifting is a, is a uh, uh, exercise that should be used at some level in every every exercise program. So how do you get a major league pitcher, for example, to think about incorporating a deadlift into his training program? 
Well, you, you program at one, but you make sure that they know uh, the benefits of foundational movement pattern development. Um, you know, when you look at the deadlift, for instance, you know, it's arguably the king of all movements. And, you know, what is the most prevalent injury for, you know, Major League Baseball pitchers, for example, that you just mentioned? It's going to be shoulder inju- injuries, duh, but it's going to be lower back hip complex injuries. So when you look at building resilience through the lower back and hip complex, what beats a loaded hip hinged movement pattern? Nothing. So building up capacities, uh, under loading, under programming, you know, that's going to be something that translates into, hey, you're going to stay healthy this season because we're actually going to put in the work to bulletproof the body. And at that point, the buy-in's pretty good. And really, this day and age, we have uh, not so much of an under-training problem in athletic performance uh, in the youth sector. It's more of an over-training problem. So I think people do have, um, especially athletes, they do have experience going through some of these big foundational movement lifts. Uh, it's just a manner of tapering it to them, customizing it to their bodies, and really just using variations and uh, programming that is going to yield the optimal result. Yeah, Yeah, that's great feedback. That's great feedback. Uh, Do you want to just, I know we didn't want to get too far into it, but do you want to touch a little bit on FHT or or direct people to, uh, to go there or to the site or... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, If you guys want to check out the FHT program, it's over on my site, drjohnrussin.com forward slash FHT. And uh, we have an entire uh, landing page over there with all the details on the programs. Uh, Most likely you'll see testimonials from from some coaches that you read on a daily basis that we've coached on that program. And that's been one of the most rewarding things is we've put a hundred plus industry experts through that program for 12 weeks and the result, the results speak for themselves. So we keep on getting uh, really world-class people in and it's the highest compliment that I could ever get from another strength coach is allowing me to do their programming. So it's been uh, something truly special and it's, it's honestly humbling as well, but it's, it's, uh, it's a good program, and <laughs> I'll leave the, the shameless plug at that. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. That's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, we had you on to, you know, because uh, we want our listeners to benefit from, you know, what you know. So Absolutely. Exactly. Hey, so I just wanted to check on how that rivalry is going between uh, the University of Wisconsin in, in-house, your wife and yourself. Your your school is, is it BC? Was that? I'm trying to remember. No, so so Lindsay is a Boston College grad. Yeah. But she actually so she is like flying high now because she was a Patriots cheerleader for two years. Oh, she yeah. was a team captain for <laughs> uh, one year. There you go. And but we both grew up in Buffalo, New York. So uh, I'm a diehard Bills fan. She's a diehard Patriots fan. And as we all know, the Bills suck. It's been eighteen years <laughs> since they've made the playoffs. And it seems like the Patriots never lose a game and they just won a Super Bowl without having their quarterback for four games this season so Lindsay's flying high i'm kind of in the shitter here and <laughs> as long as your wife's happy that's about all that matters <laughs> happy wife happy life right exactly <laughs> well the bills sucked when they went to the super bowl too right <laughs> four times in a row Jeez. four times in a row losers <laughs> losers just put that's that in. what we're known losers for. <laughs> yeah. that's it you know it's bad when you're known for losing four straight Super Bowls. Like <laughs> if bad. you say Buffalo to anyone, that's why. Oh, oh yeah, back in the '90s, yeah, four straight Super Bowls you lost. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she'll be thinking about uh, you know getting there four times is a, quite an achievement anyway. So uh, I, I got I got one last topic to uh, to hit on here because uh, yeah. um, I'm known for uh, bashing on the hip thrusters and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm pretty pretty sure you're a promoter of the uh, the, the hip thruster. So uh, mm. uh, let's talk a little bit about that. <laughs> so I would not necessarily call myself a promoter of the hip thrust. Uh, we do program it in. It's not a staple foundational movement pattern. So it's not in all of our programming like the other six foundations. But it's something that we uh, we use from uh, – like we have a couple IFBB pros that we manage. Uh, if they're trying to bring up their glute hypertrophy, it's something that we use there. We use multiple different variations of the quote-unquote hip thrust, whether it be glute bridge variation 
variations for activation, whether it be barbell glute bridges, uh, banded hip thrusts, double banded hip thrusts. So we have uh, an eclectic programming view on isolated hip extension and abduction external rotation based movement. But for our strength athletes, you'll be happy to know that it is something that is few and far between with loaded strength based uh, prescription. And actually, I, I, I over exaggerated me saying I'm, I'm the basher of, of hip thrusters, but uh, he is the lord of bashing the hip thruster. <laughs> <laughs> who who no. would you consider the king of bashing the hip thrust? Oh, God, I don't. I don't know. Probably me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he's the lord of a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. No, I just, I, I, I just several years ago I got frustrated with because um, we actually we we, we use them. Um, we use them for activation. Uh, we mm -hmm. use them in assessments. You know, single leg variations, uh, two leg variations. We have standing versions of like hip extension that we do. Uh, actually, several videos of these on uh, Kabuki.ms of a lot of different, like, uh, I prefer to do them in a standing fashion. There's a reason for that. Uh, but because um, you're, you're actually rooted to the ground and you've got more power to actually get that full extension and maintain a neutral spine. But right. there's there's a group of people out there that, like, they hip, they hip thrust more than they deadlift. And I can't seem to get through to them that if you're doing that, it doesn't matter what you tell me, you are not getting full hip extension. And thus your, you know, your compromised spine position, which means the glutes are, you're probably hypertrophying them, but they're working independent of the system because they're not integrated with the core. Seems like a pretty simple concept to me. And uh, so it's like, yeah, they're great. But you know, if you're using over 300 pounds, you might want to reevaluate, you know, so. So uh, we have a couple golden rules that we program the, the quote unquote hip thrust variations with. First off, we do not train it in the power and strength set and rep schemes. Like first and foremost, you're not loading up 800 pounds for a three RM. Like that's just Ex not happening. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing is we try to promote uh, hypertrophy and metabolic-based stress with our programming schemes. So we are doing things that tap into multiple planar movement. So we are tapping into extension plus external rotation and slight abduction at the hip. That will show that there's going to be a higher force output and activation through the fibers of the glute max. So that's another thing that we do. The way that we achieve that is by using banded variations. We use uh, eclectic uh, ground approach variations. And also we program in extremely high rep schemes, anywhere from maybe 20 to 50 reps. Hey. We'll the the thing. third thing is, you know, if we are looking for uh, tissue tolerance, so, you know, having um, hip extension is very, very important. But when we're looking at, uh, you know, making you more resilient against injuries, you know, the hip thrust can definitely play uh, a, a role in that. But the way that we try to do it is we uh, use pre and post fatigues with many of the hip thrust or glute bridge variations that we use. And we pair them with uh, single leg stance based movements like lunges or split squats squats, or even pair them with squat-based movements or even uh, leg presses. So there's always different ways to uh, create a synergy with something that has like uh, a very dogmatic following in our industry, because really nothing's inherently bad. It's just a matter of how you're programming how you it. it. And yep. Exactly. So, and, and that was why I, you know, obviously I haven't talked to you about hip thrusters before this instance, but I have a feeling <laughs> that we're probably still on the exact same common ground. Um, and yeah, you're 25 to 50, like band resisted. We do some rooted ones. Uh, we call it the, uh, uh, pony ride, but, uh, <laughs> but we program them exactly 20 to 25 to 50 reps, uh, bands against the hips in a rooted fashion standing very, so pretty similar approach, but yeah, it's just when people misapply it and that's where I, I struggle and then thinking that it's going to have some fantastic carryover to a, a pure strength based sport, like. It's just not there. So. I just had a great idea. What's that? So for the cage, you know what we're yeah. going to change your training to? No. no. A one rep max hip thrust. <laughs> <laughs> that way, wait, uh, wait, wait. Uh, that way you will now be 
the Lord of Bashing Hip Thrust, but also the King of Hip Thrust. No one oh, yeah. can talk to you. Oh, yes. Yeah, so so we add that to the grand goals. We add that to the grand goals. doing a thousand pound hip thrust. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Thousand pound hip thrust. <laughs> I thought you, you, could, you could probably go do it this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> you, you probably the, way, the, the way I see people do them, I think I could. <laughs> <laughs> John, we could, uh, we could yeah. go on for another hour for sure. Uh, there's so much content. I'm going to have to listen to this over two or three times to pick up all of the nuggets and pearls of wisdom you had in there it's great but we are bumping up against time and maybe uh sometime later this year we'll have you back for uh john russ and part two that would be great uh it's been an awesome time on with you guys the three-headed monsters seem to work well and uh <laughs> man it's been, it's been a fun podcast uh, yeah. um also check uh take a look uh john and uh, christian are doing a pretty extensive uh seminar series uh this coming year uh christian thibodeau so uh uh, I don't know if you want to touch on that at all, but uh... yeah, Chris and I are doing a 2017 world tour. Uh, we are doing around 20 dates throughout the world. We're going to be a couple here in America, up into Canada, over in Europe, Asia, and Australia. So we're literally going all the continents this year. Uh, That's we're a really busy just... schedule. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, it is, and uh, we're doing two day seminar series, and we're really focusing in on the art of programming, the art of evaluating movement, how to fix weaknesses, but also how to train around pain. So we're really going to be going through those big six foundational movement patterns and really coaching trainers and fitness professionals up on the systems that we use with our athletes and our clients. I really love that people are getting back to some of these basic movements for both evaluation and progression. So um, that's that's a huge cornerstone of what we've been pushing in because I think that uh, a little bit as an industry we got too far down the path of these specialty movements and correctives and kind of lost the the value of like some basic <laughs> movements and load and load them right and you can see what's going on and you can make corrections and then now you can progress it so. Our uh, mutual friend Craig Liebenson will uh, credit me with uh, originating the term rehab purgatory. So <laughs> that's what we want to stay out of. We want to stay out of rehab purgatory. We want to do big, loaded foundational movements. We want to get freaking strong. And that's what's going to yield results with longevity, with performance, and injury prevention. Absolutely. That's a good way to close this out. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, list your website one more time for us, John, for our listeners. It is drjohnrussin.com, D-R-J-O-H-N-R-U-S-I-N.com. Excellent. Social media? Social media, everything's over on the site, but uh, my Instagram is at drjohnrussin. Twitter is at johnrussin, and Facebook is both Dr. John Russin and John Russin if you want to follow my personal page. All right. Great, John. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks again, guys. Thank you.